Keep working. Uh, thanks everybody to the uh, first session of LinuxConf AU 2017 in Hobart. Uh, just as the first session of the official conference, I just wanted to acknowledge and pay respects to the Aboriginal, uh, Aboriginal community as additional and original owners <coughs> and continuing custodians of this land on which we gather today. Today, and acknowledge the elders past and present. Today, our first session is with Cedric Bai. Uh, he's talking on Enlightenment Foundation Libraries, case studies of optimising for wearable devices. Uh, Cedric's been with Samsung and Open Source for 10 years. Uh, sorry, Open Source and working on the Enlightenment project for 10 years. And Cedric's asked if you have questions, if you could ask them during the, uh, the talk, that's absolutely fine. And with that, I'll hand over to Cedric. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to talk about uh, Enlightenment Foundation Library. I'm not too sure, so everyone knows what it is. So I will just go quickly about what it is, actually. And after that, we will start to look at what is optimizing for uh, wearable and uh, this kind of embedded device on small batteries. So Enlightenment Foundation Library, or EFL, was created in around 2001 for Enlightenment 17. So it has been in the development for more than a decade now. Uh, Enlightenment 17 uh, has a very long history. It was known by most people first for Enlightenment 16, which was a the first GNOME window manager in 1999 or 97 or something like that, like a long time ago. Uh, and uh, Enlightenment 17 was a full rewrite of it. Uh, the idea is that uh, at the time, the team around Enlightenment didn't believe that there will be a year of the Linux desktop but we believe that there was much more interesting things to be done on, at the time it was like this small IPAC uh, touch screen interface and there will be something to be done there. So it was designed from the beginning uh, for the embedded world and for that we needed a toolkit. Uh, there was no toolkit at the time and we still consider that there is no toolkit today that is really designed for embedded world. Uh, so that's why EFL existed uh, because nothing did match or need. Uh, Enlightenment uh, 17 that was released maybe 2011, something like that. We are today at 21, so Enlightenment 21. Uh, it's used EFL, scene graph, and main loop, and all the infrastructure that EFL provide to. It's, it's a normal application, actually, the way it's developed. And it means that EFL, which was built for only a window manager, turned actually to be usable for writing any kind of application. And uh, we kind of uh, over engineer uh, kind of trait there. So it's why it took us like maybe 10 years to get a toolkit because, well, it was the easy thing to display things on screen, but then you need all these widgets, you need to support uh, a lot of things that were not there, were not easy to see there. So Enlightenment, Enlightenment today is a composite and window manager. It does, uh, does Wayland protocol. Uh, it does work on the frame buffer, DRM, and X. Uh, it's uh, quite highly customizable. Uh, and one of the reasons for the customizable is Samsung is using it for that purpose. It's actually running on every Samsung TV uh, that has been sold since last year. Uh, no, 2015, so the year before. We changed here. Uh, and uh, it's people will not notice that there is a window manager when they are running the TV, ob obviously. Uh, same thing actually for uh, Samsung Gear Watch, which are also running Enlightenment. Uh, and there's a few camera, dishwasher and stuff like that. So we, we have a need at Samsung to have something that is highly customizable that we almost don't see there, but it's quite useful. And uh, in terms of performance, to give you an idea, uh, we do uh, care a lot about performance on Enlightenment and uh, we are doing better than Weston on the Raspberry Pi. So that's kind of give you uh, the goal of where we are there. Even if it's a more complex piece of software, it doesn't mean that it has to be slower. And all of that rely on Enlightenment Foundation Library itself, uh, which is uh, basically, we spent a decade to write it, so that's kind of, a it has evolved over time, so it's a mix match of LGPL, BSD code, uh, there is no real, nobody can really own the code. It's a uh, true bazaar development, uh, which means that there is no li uh, license uh, that you have to abide uh, to be able to give your code to, to Enlightenment. It's just like developed like normal open source software. 
Uh, some other toolkit don't have that, I'm uh, just saying. Uh, it's really focused on embedded device. Oh, that's kind of a main interest. Uh, enlightenment on your desktop does work. That's actually what I'm using today here. Uh, but it's absolutely not comparable to what GNOME or KDE are providing. Uh, that's not where our interest has been. So that's something that we should, I guess, not expect. Uh, we also are focusing on the long-term stability of our API and ABI. That's something very important also for Samsung. Because obviously when you do an application for your phone, for your tablet, for your TVs, your watch, you don't want to write a new application for every new watch that come out. So we have to make care, take care of having a long-term API and ABI stability so that people writing application for uh, EFL on those device don't get them broken apart uh, at the next release. And we are trying to get a, a kind of a fast release cycle, like a three months uh, time-based release cycle. It's kind of going well, more or less. We are more to four months and three months, but it's kind of doing its purpose of keeping us on track and adding features. Uh, so as I said, EFL has been built to for doing a window manager, but actually it has evolved to doing uh, any kind of, uh, of uh, application. It does provide its own uh, scene graph and rendering library. I will use that later on as our, my talk goes about optimization because that's where actually most of the optimization matters these days. Uh, and it's where we have put most of the uh, optimization for reducing CPU, GPU, memory, and battery usage. Uh, that's scene graph gives you one place where you can optimize the application. It's one central place which gives you a view of what the application is doing. So that's something that's uh, core to the design of uh, this toolkit. We do provide our international language support, so left to right, right to left. Uh, UTF-8 is like the basic string support, kind of expected today, but uh, not really uh, 10 years ago. Uh, we do uh, support all kind of uh, screen and input device. So it's something that people don't realize, but uh, we don't really actually re request DPI information because DPI doesn't tell you how far from the screen the user is. Uh, so if you have like a, a, a phone, it has a very high DPI, but you are putting it near, near your nose. And when you have a, 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 a smartwatch, it has actually a lower DPI, but it's at the same distance. So it should have a different scale factor. And so what we are doing is what we call a scale factor, which is basically an, uh, a number that is chosen either by the user or the manufacturer, uh, which scale all the UI to that ratio and try to keep every readable item uh, readable, uh, whatever uh, the typical use of your device is. Uh, theoretically, we could let actually the user change the scale factor the way they want. Uh, I don't think we do that in any device these days, uh, but it's what the toolkit allows is that we have these nodes and we can scale the UI. It will only scale readable elements, so icons, text, but for example, not the border of uh, your button if you don't want that to scale. Uh, there is, uh, it's kind of interesting features uh, for embedded device there. Uh, we support accessibility. Uh, we are obviously fully themable uh, and we don't want to have a TV that looks like a PC, obviously, so uh, that's a given. Uh, we support what we call profile. Uh, profile is a set of configuration or uh, like a theme, scale factor, and a bunch of other values that define uh, your screen property so that when you have an application, it will get the configuration for that screen where it is running and it will be able to adapt on other screen with different configuration. Uh, and uh, the current total cost of using EFL, the minimal set of dependency you need for an embedded device is eight megabyte of flash. Uh, that's without the theme, actually, uh, because the biggest usual uh, <coughs> consumer of disk space is actually the image that you have in your theme. So if you have a simple UI, you can s fit into smaller space than if you have a complex UI, which is kind of logic. And we have a very modular design that so we can remove component uh, to, to let you optimize for, for your target. So why do we care so much about optimization here? I'll one of the first thing is that Moore's law doesn't apply on battery and memory bandwidth. I mean, it's kind of obvious to say it, but uh, your battery is not improving every two years by twice as well. So 
we have to care about, about these things if we want to be able to provide improvements. It's mostly by software and not really by, uh, by doing a better hardware. So there is no free battery and no free memory bandwidth showing up every two years for us. And anyways, our memorial flow is slowing down these days, so we should also not expect an improvement on the CPU side uh, as, well as, as nice as it had been in the past. Uh, we are still around like 20 months or 24 months, I don't know where we are these days, but we are slowing down for sure. Uh, so it's something to keep in mind. We also care about uh, this kind of optimization because on the long run, uh, that's where things are going. Also, one of the trends on system on chip uh, suck is that uh, you have this lot of block that are like decompressing JPEG or decompressing uh, H264, which are not really usable directly by your application as a general purpose CPU. So it's a very dedicated block and it doesn't improve the general performance of your application. It's very typical workload that you can offload to these uh, blocks on your, on your system on chip. And it doesn't really gain higher performance. It may actually help for uh, improving your efficiency and getting more battery out of uh, using the hardware JPEG decoder, for example. But overall, you don't get free more CPU. So you need to be careful how you use your CPU on most of this uh, system on chip. And one of the things that actually limits your, your task as an application is memory bandwidth. It's the, most, it's the biggest constraint uh, on any UI today is how much bandwidth you need to render your UI on screen. And the screen, uh, as it goes up in resolution, is actually kind of going square because it doubles in both directions. So the memory bandwidth uh, grows kind of exponentially as the resolution increases these days. So we have very high constraint on memory bandwidth for rendering. And that's where most of the optimization starts, is by re reducing your memory bandwidth. Also, uh, people think that a low-end phone these days has four gigabytes of RAM, it has a GPU, it's kind of a, even at $70, you can get a phone that is kind of really impressive uh, in terms of performance. But $70 of added CPU and GPU and memory for a dishwasher, refrigerator, or oven is kind of doubling the price of this device. So we don't have this kind of luxury in the low end of where we are running uh, EFL and Enlightenment. So we do care about optimization because of that. Uh, we have very, very low end stuff that need to be able to run. And there is also, any, anyway, uh, when you are using a low end phone, uh, your web browser is kind of consuming memory fast. And uh, that's kind of a big issue these days. So if your native application keep using the less amount of memory possible, it kind of makes the experience of the overall usage of the phone better. Uh, it's kind of a shame for us, but uh, we are optimizing because the other guys is not, and they have a hard time actually keeping up. So, and, and the last thing is that uh, we have a software renderer, and the reason why we have software is that most UI don't need a GPU to be rendered fast, and it actually, uh, in some cases, is more efficient to use a CPU than the GPU for rendering. If you have just a blinking cursor, it's much more efficient to use just a CPU to update that on screen than to use a full GPU to, to do. And so OpenGL also comes from, if you are lucky, only 10 megabytes per process, but more usual to go to 40 and even above. So when you have like 512 megabytes of RAM, uh, gigabyte, uh, megabyte of RAM, 40 megabytes of RAM being gone per application just because you're open, using OpenGL, that's not going to cut it. So it's bad basically for multitasking in general. That's kind of giving you the state of uh, where we are reading there. Uh, so, as I've been saying, the main driving force of all application runtime memory use and CPU use and GPU use is the screen size. The bigger your screen, uh, the more you are consuming just to run the stuff on screen, and it's kind of expand it, as it's expanding both directions on the screen. It's kind of a square thing, kind of a big issue. Uh, EFL itself has been optimized to a point where we are. Uh, really lower battery consumption than Android. Uh, on some of our tests, we have 30% uh, more efficient than Android, uh, which is something that matters on a phone, because if you have a phone, for example, or a smartwatch, which has 10 hours with an Android-based system, and you have 30% more, you go with 13 hours, and most people will go to bed at, after 13 hours of being awake. So there is 
there is a big difference there uh, to be noted. Um, uh, that's also we, we try to try to fit Enlightenment and EFL in, into very small package uh, to try to go into the very lower end of things. Uh, some people have pushed it to one megabyte of uh, just to use this the smallest part of EFL. Basically, no theme support, no widget set, but just a thin graph, being able to display JPEG and PNG, really small UI, one megabyte is enough. And we can actually run a desktop, and that's exactly what the last number are. 48 megabyte of RAM, that's all you need for your desktop to run a terminal console, and uh, a 300 megahertz uh, CPU uh, for a 1024 by 768 uh, screen is all you need for desktop, really desktop. Nothing different than from your desktop, which gives you an idea of where we have been optimizing things. So now I'm going to switch more and do enter the energy efficiency of, of this talk, because that's what you focus on when you are doing wearable. Uh, the more efficient you are on your energy use on the software side, all the more the user can go with his uh, watch or his whatever device he is wearing. So the obvious one is to say that if you are more energy efficient, uh, you're using, well, you have a better battery life. But there is also other things like uh, when you have better efficiency of your CPU, you are also dissipate, have a need to dissipate less heat. And when you have a, your watch, which is on your wrist, it's kind of in contact with your skin. So you prefer that to not start to be at 50 degree Celsius. So that's kind of a, will be an issue to be burned by your watch. So there is uh, also, we have pressure to do thinner device. So the more efficient you have on the software side, the more the designer can go crazy and remove actually size from the battery and make things thinner because you need less of it to do the same thing as, the, as other people need. So overall, if energy efficiency provide more freedom to the designer to do whatever product they want. And the last thing is that uh, there is a huge trend in uh, electric device uh, that they are basically the biggest uh, energy consumption growth in the past decade. Uh, so being more energy efficient there uh, is something that actually should matter for everyone uh, because uh, our energy bills is kind of growing up because of these guys these days. So that's something to keep in mind. So how do you optimize for energy efficiency? What is interesting is actually energy efficiency is not much at being efficient. So if you are optimizing for speed, for memory, for network use, you finally, uh, you already have done a lot of work for optimizing for battery. So I'm going to cover um, all of that and at the end only focus on optimizing really for battery. But, uh, and also there is something to be done at the design place. If as a designer you take into account our energy efficiency, uh, we will, I will talk about that and see that there is design that are better for energy efficient than other. But uh, let's start with speed. It's obvious that if you are more efficient to do anything, it's obviously going to be more efficient on energy side. So if you, if you are only doing what you need and be faster by doing so, uh, you are obviously going to be more efficient on, the, uh, on your power consumption. So this also applied to the GPU. Uh, most GPU these days come with uh, what we call partial rendering and partial update. Uh, basically, you can give space on your buffer and you say that's the only place in my buffer that really need to be updated and you can recycle buffer from one frame to the other. And that's kind of keep things at bay in terms of energy consumption. It's kind of obvious to say, but if you don't have to update your full screen and only update what has changed, uh, it does pay off, obviously. It does pay off in speed. So on the low end of the hardware, when you're not able to reach 60 frames per second, uh, this kind of optimization gets you there. But when you are already at 60 frames per second, it gives you actually more battery life. So that's an interesting step. Uh, that's when you're optimizing for speed and you are already reaching 60 frames per second, any optimization you do after that is free battery, basically. Uh, there is obvious things. Triggering animation only at the speed the hardware can handle. Don't try to over animate uh, and drop frame. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of toolkit actually do that. They try to, to push frame as fast as they can. And well, sometimes they do triple buffer and you end up with a buffer that you say, oh, well, this one, 
not going to display if the next one is already ready. So you end up with actually discarding work. And in terms of energy efficiency, it's not something you want to do. You want to absolutely only render what the user is going to see. And it's also a, a kind of a speed improvement because the, the main application will not be wa having more time for itself instead of wasting time for rendering uh, things that don't end up on screen. Uh, and uh, so after that, it's basically classic optimization, uh, making sure that uh, you identify what application really need to do, make sure that it doesn't call a function that is not useful, cache result when necessary. Uh, the good thing is that there is actually a lot of tools to do all this kind of optimization. There is uh, Valgrind as tool like CallGrind and CacheGrind, which give you a good uh, information of where your application is spending time. And you have a visualization tool like CacheGrind or Profile that give you an idea of where your application is wasting time and where you can actually optimize for speed. So that's, that's a good thing. And the other possibility is to use like very limited hardware, like a Raspberry Pi, and test your software on a Raspberry Pi and make it sure it runs there. Because if it runs on a Raspberry Pi, it's going to be quite efficient there. So that's why we use a Raspberry Pi as a benchmark for enlightenment. Because uh, if we optimize for that target, we are pretty sure we already are doing efficient work there. The next step is actually to optimize for memory use. And uh, that's the, easy, the, the reason why it actually helps is uh, when you are accessing memory, or even disk when you are swapping, that's a terrible thing, it's more and more costly when you go away from the CPU cache. Uh, the CPU cache is less costly in terms of energy to use. And as you go further away from the CPU, you have to make more energy to get that information back to the CPU. So the less memory you use, the less memory you access, the less memory you fetch, well, the less energy you consume uh, fetching it, obviously. So from there, it's a classical work of optimization. You improve cache locality, uh, because when you improve cache locality, you are less fetching memory from the main uh, memory bank and use only the CPU cache. Uh, you prefer linear access and array uh, to random access uh, over the place. And uh, we have been, uh, we didn't expect that. We were working on uh, actually, our, we discovered that by actually working on an optimization for memory usage, uh, which is kind of a user space copy and write. And we were deduplicating our object structure. Um, most objects have a lot of property that are the same. Uh, so most toolkit don't really care. They have the same private fields that are duplicated in all of our, these widgets and objects. In EFL, we have a, stru um, a structure that allows them to be shared across objects. And uh, by carefully uh, choosing what we are sharing and deduplicating them, we got a 5% speed improvement on deduplicating this memory usage. And the reason is that it was more cache efficient, and it actually also led to uh, a more energy efficient uh, system, obviously. Uh, in one case, that was impact, in, impacting the speed of walking the scene graph, uh, and that was an uh, interesting thing. See so that, uh, in general, deduplicating your memory usage, we, we tend to do like STRD up, we tend to like mm, malloc and mem copy so easily around that we don't see the real cost that is behind it. Uh, but as you add up things, uh, it starts to be costly. And uh, as with speed improvements. Uh, there is also tools for that. I cannot say more that Massive and Massive Visualizer has really amazing tools to track for that problems and to try to see what's going on. Uh, it's also interesting because when you are trying to run your software under Valgrind, it slows down easily. So if your software is still usable under Valgrind, it's also kind of a benchmark to tell you <laughs> how efficient it is. And the next one is an interesting one that people don't really re realize today, but network use in most applications is very important, or especially for us, we do wearable and devices that are connected by wireless network. And it's kind of obvious to say it, but there is a huge uh, energy use related to the network data that you're transferring. Uh, some are not as obvious, but the more data you send to a network, the more your device has to retry sending. Because the wireless net link is not perfect, 
So you have loss always on the link. So the more data you send, the more loss you're likely to have, and the more the system is going to retry and waste energy doing so. So one of the first things to say is just try to keep your protocol compact just to avoid uh, that energy cost. But there is also a twist on the download side because most wireless stacks are actually having a, a high energy profile and a low energy profile. And the switch between one to the other takes some time. So you will stay for 10, 12 seconds on the high energy profile because of how the protocol, of the wireless protocol itself is designed before you can actually go uh, to the low profile, the low energy profile. And it will take maybe a few seconds actually to switch. And this means that if you write an application, you need to schedule your downloads in a way where they are all packed at the beginning into the smallest amount of time so that you can go uh, into the lower uh, energy consumption mode as soon as possible. But then it's, a, it's kind of a challenge because you don't know what your user is doing. So it's difficult to, to foresee what your user is going to request as data. So you don't want to over download because if you download data that you don't need, it's also a waste of energy, obviously. So it's, it's not easy to figure the right balance of what needs to be downloaded and when. And anyway, there is a next problem, is that you have multiple applications on your, uh, your device which are running at the same time. And some will do the download and try to do this work and do, do the work correctly in 10 seconds. But then the kernel will not do its job nicely. It will schedule things like one application far away from the other and you will not be able to go into the lower energy mode because the time between both applications making the network request was too, uh, too big and, not, and too, not too small enough that it expands the high energy profile need where it should not. And that's something that is actually not uh, addressed at all on, on Linux today, is that uh, there is no way for application on the network side to work together uh, to, to get our, the more efficient uh, use of the network. Uh, finally, optimizing for the battery use. Uh, it is mostly a job done today by scheduler. So the scheduler of the Linux kernel is the one uh, that will put your task on some CPU. There is a CPU idler that will, that will also turn on and off the CPUs and the CPU frequency driver that will scale up and down the CPUs. That's kind of a mess right now because um, it's, it's evolving. Uh, there is work being done. Uh, the main fix is what is called the energy aware scheduler project. But basically, until recently, and I think it's, I'm not sure it's still, it has landed already in the kernel, but all these components are not talking together. They are watching system loads and they're pretty also uh, have no memory of the past. So when you move a task from one pro CPU to the other, the, the kernel scheduler lost, lost its memory. And all this information is actually what makes your process energy efficient is the combo of frequency and CPU being turned on at the right time for your workload. Because if it's turned out too late, uh, you are going to be very slow for your user and you're going to consume more energy than if you are at the right setup or the other way around. You stay at a very high energy use when your application doesn't do anything. And that is something that is very common with uh, user space application because they are very interactive. So they, their profile change uh, very often. Uh, so there has been uh, work being going on on the Linux kernel uh, to link the frequency and the idle to the scheduler to make them uh, work together, have a better memory uh, over like 20, 20 millisecond windows and stuff like that. It's, it's interesting going on there, but as a user space, we're not helping them because we are drawing frame at 60 millisecond per, uh, per frame. And 16 millisecond is where we start with a task that is IO bound. Then we switch to memory bound. Then we switch to CPU bound task. Then again to memory bound. And all of that into 16 millisecond. So the kernel has basically, and we change that for almost every frame. Every frame is going to be different. So for the kernel, even if they improve things, on the user space, we are absolutely not helping these guys. And uh, well, they can try to improve their Oracle, but if on the user space we don't improve our own work, uh, it's not going to help. 
So now I'm going to focus on the main uh, component in EFL, which is a scene graph, which is where most of the time is spent in an application is on drawing things on screen. Uh, for almost every application, they just fetch a bunch of data from the net, squabble with them, and then often uh, ask to update the screen. And that's where most of the work is. It's on updating the screen. So a quick explanation of what a scene graph is, because I'm not sure that everyone <coughs> here knows what it is. A scene graph is actually a tree or graph of, of primitive graphical object like rectangle, image, font, uh, shape, 3D objects. Uh, it is very often used referring to 3D games more than 2D or uh, UI. But it gives you one place where you can reuse your data, where you can see what has changed between two frames. Because you have your tree and you have the previous tree, and you can do deltas. And you can know what has changed. You can reorder things to make sure that when you are updating your screen, you use your GPU the more efficiently possible by limiting shader, texture, and context switch in general. You can make sure that you are splitting your workload according to CPU, memory, and IO bound things. So if you look at what a scene graph process was when we first started EFL, it was really a mix match of walking the tree, layouting objects, or trying to start computing CPU intensive data. Like uh, when you are doing a rotation, you need to, to do this uh, computation of the, where the line starts, when the line up, uh, end. You have to compute uh, decoding image. Uh, you have to do all these things. And we were doing them completely serialized. So that's, that was the first uh, things that needed to be fixed for us, is to go to something like that. And we did that for performance reason. Uh, because obviously, if you offload the rendering thread, the thread that does all the drawing, uh, the main application, which is in the main thread, uh, can continue to do this business until the frame is pushed to screen. And that's kind of something that you can easily parallelize. So that was the first step for us. But that still doesn't help the kernel, because we have still a main loop, which does a bunch of like walking the tree, uh, the scene graph tree, is something that is mostly memory bound. Uh, you are jumping around in memory, uh, walking your tree. While the layout is mostly CPU intensive, because you are computing the shape of every object, staying on that uh, structure for quite some time. And that's, that's something that is uh, to take into account. So where we are working now and where we are going into this exploded tree of things, uh, some of the things like the layout of objects uh, is kind of showing itself in the same rendering pipeline of the, as a main loop. Because the idea is that you have to switch to a different process to tell the kernel that you are actually uh, doing uh, something different. Because the kernel only track is scheduling need per process. So threads is kind of a process also there. So if you switch your, your, work, your work, even if it's serialized, if you switch to another thread, your work, the kernel can learn that this thread is actually something that will be uh, more CPU intensive than the rest. So you can learn about things this way. And basically what we have to do is to split the workload and make sure that everything that is CPU intensive end up into a CPU intensive thread. Everything that is memory bound has to end up into a memory bound thread. Everything that is uh, like IO bound, mainly in the main loop if we can. So that's where we are trying to go. Obviously, there is a price to pay with this strategy. Uh, because when you have more thread, you need to have one stack per thread. You have an overall increase in the memory usage because you have more thread. It's something that you cannot fight. It's there. It's also increased the complexity. Uh, you now have the risk of race condition of not looking things correctly. Even if it's serialized, you may mess up. So it's, it's kind of increasing the difficulty to get things right. And it may also debugging uh, a little bit harder. Also, there is no way to be explicit to the kernel. Because as a developer, I know that what my application is going to do when I enter this function. I know exactly what kind of workload I'm going to know. And I could tell the kernel with the int that that's supposed to be rendering. So keep track of that thing in your rendering bucket. And keep track of that thing into a drawing bucket. And keep track of that thing into a scene graph bucket. But kernels, uh, they have a huge constraint as to have API, ABI stability for decades. 
So they are very resistant to new API being added to the kernel. So we better forget about giving any int via a new API to the kernel and just work around that. So that is something that actually impacts more than just all the toolkits. It has to impact even the design of your application. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a good question today is how to even improve the toolkit to make your application easier to develop with that in mind. And uh, that's something we have not really figured out yet. And the, the last kind of thing is that when you have finished with this uh, complex pipeline rendering, it's become very close to actually what you want when you are doing Vulkan, because you want to be building all your Vulkan pipeline uh, in parallel as much as possible. So it kind of gets us on the way there, uh, which is interesting side effects. It's something that we didn't really look for when we started that project. And finally, uh, there is optimizing your design, your, what you display on screen. Uh, it's something that some, it's actually hard to get to designer to give them constraint, uh, but that's something that is really to be taken into account, is that, for example, an AMOLED screen is consuming no energy to display black. The darker your screen, the less energy it consumes. And for example, Reddit has a black theme and it has also a white theme, and it consumes 41% less energy on Android if you are using the black theme, if you have an Android AMOLED screen. Uh, if you are doing a lot of animation, full screen animation, full screen update, that's bad for your, for your energy battery, also your energy consumption, of course. Uh, some <coughs> screen have a frame buffer integrated in the screen. And that allows the CPU to completely stop and turn off everything and go into deep suspend once it's updated. One of the typical use cases for that is actually smartwatch. If you update your watch every second, it gives you like a long time, a second for a CPU to be asleep. And uh, if it's every minute, it's even, even better. So there is hardware things that to be done that actually reduce um, your hardware uh, visual design that improve things. Also, it's kind of obvious, but the more complex, the more layer you have into your UI, uh, the more energy it needs to be rendered. So you end up with the more complex a scene is, the more layer you have rendering something, the more energy it's needed. So if you can keep things simple on the design side, you actually save battery life. And it's kind of obvious, but if you draw a screen with just rectangle and vertical gradient, uh, it's something that we are very good at optimizing because gradient and rectangle can be optimized with mem copy, uh, mem set actually. So it's a one-way mem set. It's very nice to do. So that's a, a little bit of where I'm going to stop. And if anyone has any question on, on the topic or on any question at all. Oh, yes. Um, when you're optimizing for battery life, in general, do you find uh, it better to work the CPU hard and go to sleep or to slow the CPU down and run it at half speed? Uh, it actually depends on, on the workload. If you are memory bound, uh, lowering the frequency of the CPU is actually what, what's nicer. Uh, so, for example, when you are doing all the drawing phase, uh, you are most likely not going to be at the full CPU speed. Uh, but when you are computing the graphical uh, shape, like the font glyph, or when you are doing uh, decompressing of a JPEG, uh, that is a little bit more, uh, when the JPEG is already in memory, it's more of a me uh, uh, CPU-bound task. So there you want to be getting the CPU as fast as possible. And that's where like, you have a problem, because you have state where you want to have very high CPU there, and state where you want to have lower CPU needs. And that is in a 16 millisecond window. You need to have this change happening. And uh, we, we have interesting benchmark. Uh, I have kind of gone through, but uh, as the Linux kernel is not fixed yet on this scheduler, uh, most, what most of the other manufacturers are doing is that they are using this daemon that is running in the background, watching which application is running, and tweaking the nodes and trying to figure out for each application what is the best CPU frequency, uh, GPU frequency, and stuff like that. It's absolutely awful, but that's the best we have today. Another question?
Okay. Well, thank you very much. Have a good day.